It's a pleasure and an honor for me to be here with you. And um, I, a few years ago, accepted this invitation, um, and I had no idea what I was signing up for. Um, one of my somewhat endearing qualities that I, is that I can uh, be a little clueless at times. So with, with, with no understanding or who this group was or who they stood for, I just said yes. <laughs> and, uh, and here I am. And um, I'm, I love this, and I love um, who you stand, who you are, and the place that you um, bring to Reiki. So, um, I'm a little bit nervous because uh, very often I know the people that I'm <laughs> talking to, so there's this level of safety. And, um, and I mean, I'll tell you, I was so uh, uncertain that I had to do a little research with some of my friends discreetly and ask them, what's the dress code? <laughs> because uh, I'm a country boy and I mostly wear jeans and I've, ch I've, I've uh, decided not to wear socks anymore, although today I am, because... <laughs> and, um, and I never wear a jacket. <laughs> so, I mean, this is the first time, and I've been traveling for over 30 years, that I packed a jacket, you know, so... We're on it! <laughs> and luckily, one of the services that I was given, because I live in the... In the on the tenth floor, is I got two free presses. <laughs> so these slacks, which I found in my closet, and this jacket have been pressed. Um, to begin, I, I would love your support. And... Um, and the support is going to come in your willingness, I hope, to, um, to do a little exercise or two that, um, that I'd like to lead you through. So I'm just assuming you're willing because you're sweet people. <laughs> um, and um, so, the first... So, a, a, an, a concept that I've learned in the last few years. Um, the, the concept is innocent perception. So, in, innocent perception is, is just is kind of like that childlike quality of seeing things for the first time or seeing things before we have lots of ideas about and interpretations of. It's, it's just seeing from this, this new place. Um, I think, you know, there's an expression in Buddhism, I think, of a uh, beginner mind, you know, beginner mind. Just this place of innocent perception. So, um, I'm going to call on you to uh, connect with that place. And what I'd like you to do, uh, if you're willing, is to close your eyes softly and place your hands on yourselves. And allow yourselves just to consciously be in Reiki. And I'd like you to go back to your first conscious experience of Reiki. Whatever that was, receiving a treatment, 
sometime in your first class. And just connect with that first conscious experience from the perspective of your innocent perception and find a word or a word or two that names the essence of that experience. Simply naming the essence of that experience. And I invite you to write that down, if you would. Just write it down. And um, could I hear a few? Any volunteers? Peaceful. Thank you. Pure love. Thank you. Spontaneous. Thank you. Bliss. Thank you. Astonishment. Astonishment. Thank you. Awe. Awe. Thank you. Relief. 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 Thank you. Alchemy. Alchemy. Is that? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Curiosity. Curiosity. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. No, that's not enough. I'm going to ask more of you. Um, I'm going to ask you four questions. I would like you to write down the answers. Okay? The first question is, what was your conscious reason for learning Reiki? Why did you go to the class? What was your motivation? Your conscious reason for learning Reiki. And, and the question is, it's really a simple focus. So it, there was a story, there was a context. <laughs> That's not what I'm asking for, the story, the context. Just the, you know, why did you go? <laughs> okay? Good. The second question is, how many years ago was that? Don't write a date. Don't be lazy. Do the arithmetic. <laughs> How many years ago was that? The third question is, from the perspective of today, what was your 
unconscious reason or reasons for learning Reiki. Another way of putting that is, um, what have you discovered, well, have you discovered any hidden reasons that you learned Reiki? And the fourth and final question is, um, why are you still practicing? <laughs> yeah. Why do you keep practicing? Thank you for being willing to uh, do these little exercises. Um, and if you have the opportunity, I encourage you sometime during the weekend to sit with three or four or five people and share the answers to those four questions. And just receive them. There's uh, a lot of talk of research these days in the world of Reiki, historical research, um, research about Usui Sensei, the, the cultural uh, container that, that uh, this practice was held in. And um, as a team member, that's not my gift <laughs> or my inclination. What has been my point of research in these 37 years of practice is what is Reiki teaching me? Is what is the effect of the practice of Reiki in my life over these years and the lives of my students and my colleagues, and my colleague students, and, um, and, and this research is really cross-cultural and, and uh, uh, multicultural. I, I, the Reiki Alliance, that, uh, a, a community that I am a part of, has members from 48 different countries at the moment. And uh, we have an annual gathering, and last year there were 23 different countries um, represented. And, um, you know, one of the things that my teacher, she had these little sayings that have become uh, possibly immortal, I'm not sure. At least in my community, they become immortal. <laughs> and one is, Reiki will teach you. Reiki will teach you. And, and that has been uh, part of my grounding, part of my foundation is this, this uh, awareness to pay attention 
to what, what Reiki is teaching me. And, um, and so that's the, the basis of my, uh, what I'd like to share with you today is this reflection on what I feel like Reiki has taught me. And um, I, I met Hawaii Takata in 1978. You know, in a strange situation. I mean, I was, I was taking a course at the university for very um, shallow motivation. I was teaching in a high school at the time, a Catholic high school teaching religion, to 14-year-old boys. Boy, is that a treat. <laughs> and, uh, um, and I, I wasn't making much money, and uh, so I learned, you know, that my salary was dependent on two things, my years of experience, and, um, and they didn't count my six years of previous teaching experience because I, I did it before I had a degree. <laughs> and, uh, but, so, you know, it was kind of important to make a little bit more money to get by in the world. And, um, and every time I got six university units, I also jumped on the pay scale. So that was my motivation for going to school. Continued education. I was in a master's program in education. I never saw my advisor. I just was in it for the units. <laughs> I was in it for the money. And if I learned something along the way, great. <laughs> so I only took courses that I was interested in, you know. So group dynamics. Uh, Chinese Buddhism, <laughs> and at some point I got drawn into this concept or this, this what was happening around me, this movement uh, called holistic health. And so one summer when I was looking through the course offerings, there was a course entitled Holistic Health and Self-Regulation. So I thought, Oh, okay. So I signed up. And uh, the course was focused by a uh, uh, Japanese-American, uh, Dr. George Araki. He was a biologist at the State University. And he and some of his colleagues had developed a little uh, offshoot of the science department called Interdisciplinary Studies in Science. So that was their front. Their agenda was <laughs> to study healing and to bring the scientific method to all these different forms of healing that have been part of the human experience since the very beginning of humankind. And um, so this course was wonderful. It was this just potpourri of what was going on, you know. So we learned, you know, a little bit about native American healing and Indian healing, Ayurvedic healing, and we did some Tai Chi and we did some meditation and we learned, we did some biofeedback and autogenic training and on and on and on. And so the course was really uh, guest speakers taught the course. And one day, the guest speaker was introduced. Her name was Hawaii Takata. And uh, she's very short, slight, smartly dressed, great presence, and an explosion of energy when she walked into the room. And, and she began by telling us a story of how she got her name, Hawaii. It's a not very Japanese name. <laughs> no. So, and that was an interesting story, which was long. And, uh, <laughs> And, sh and she told us a lot of stories. And she told us a little bit about Reiki. And um, I don't remember much of what she said. You know, I kind of got a general idea. It was this energy came through me, da-da-da, for healing. 
And she said, that, you know, if anybody's interested, um, I'll come back and teach you. And I put my hand up and signed my name. And, uh, and I was driving home, and I had just this overwhelming uh, awareness. This is what I've been looking for. And following that overwhelming awareness was cognitive dissonance, confusion, because I didn't consciously know I was looking for something. I thought everything was fine. (laughs) And so um, a few months later, I went to my first degree class. And... um, I'd just like to share with you my mental attitude. And my wife went with me. And as we're driving to the course, Paul is thinking to himself over and over again, I'm sure everybody else can do this, but not me. And I'm sure if there's any like special experience to be felt or had, everybody else will have that experience, but not me. And... Um, That was pretty much my experience. (laughs) Um, During the initiation, I thought my arms would fall off. I mean, that was the, that was my clearest experience. (laughs) And I thought, please God, help me keep my arms up because I know I'm supposed to. And I practiced. I I think this is a true statement that everyone in this room can trace at some point their first connection to Reiki, to Hawaii, to Kata. because um, she brought it out of Japan to uh, what we call the Western world, and then from the Western world it went back to Japan <laughs> in this other form, and, uh, and then out of that I discovered connections with Reiki in Japan. Prior to that time, there nobody, you know, people would, would go and look for Reiki, and they never found it in Japan. Um, so, I, so I, what I hope is that um, that I can presence her a little bit for you today, um, because um, we're connected to her, and and I have such a deep honor for her. She was the most influential person in my life because she uh, awakened me to this practice. And um, I I find it interesting that we we sometimes talk about uh, uh, Western Reiki and um, Japanese Reiki, sometimes Eastern Reiki, and, uh, and uh, make, uh, yeah, and this kind of this distinction. And um, I, I don't really resonate with that. I mean, I totally understand and know that there's a Japanese Reiki. But my experience of Hawaii Takata was that in in her being this bridge, she brought this practice. I mean, historically, we'd say okay to the West, but she didn't bring it with the intention of it being Western. You know, she stood in the middle, and, and I, you know, 
she, she translated the practice from a Japanese culture to what? It's my conviction that she translated that practice to the universal human culture. That's my conviction. That she distilled this practice to to our essential humanity so that actually, and which, which I think is really borne out because Reiki as a practice has seamlessly been taught around the world in its simplicity, it's in its profundity, the human spirit responds, responds. In, uh, what did I receive from her? A simple form of practice, a, uh, a, in a sense, kind of a hierarchy of practice, maybe that's not the great word, um, where to start. <laughs> One of her sayings, Reiki is first of all for yourself. Reiki is first of all for yourself. And then your family and friends and whoever comes to you but it's first of all for yourself. And so she taught self-treatment. And, I mean, one of her key words was practice. (laughs) Practice. One time at a conference in uh, the Netherlands, a group of, there were four or five of us, they call us now Takata Masters in this group. And, and I, we're answering questions. And, and one, of the, one of the people at the, at the conference said, what was Hawaii Takata like as a teacher? You know, we're all kind of hmm, trying to formulate our answer. And uh, Wanya Tuan <laughs> says she was like a drill sergeant. And I thought, yes, that's true. That was a great image. Do it like this. Do it like this. No notes. Watch my hands. She never allowed notes in her teaching. Watch my hands. And so my job was to go home and practice and treat myself. And I I don't know how it happened because I had learned other little practices here and there and did them for a week or a week and a half or something like that. But my wife and I went home, set our alarm clock for a half hour earlier every morning, got up and went to the loo. We're back in bed, lying side by side, doing our self-treatment. And if the other person's breathing got very suspiciously to sound like (laughs) sleep, it's like your elbows were available (laughs) to bring them back. And, And I practiced every day. I, I feel like I was held by my teacher that, and by Reiki and by what she had given me. And, you know, the, the most, one of the things she gave me was trust. She embodied this absolute trust in Reiki. Absolute I mean, I can say the words. 
And I hope, after 37 years, that I somewhat embody that. But I met her when she had been practicing for over 40 years. And the, the power of that embodiment was just profound. And, and so I practiced. And, I, and with, with all my personal insecurities, da, 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 I trusted Reiki in me. And um, that was one of her gifts. And I, you know, this may sound like a weird thing to say, but I can't help it. She's smiling at you, all of you. You know, she wanted Reiki. Um, to touch whoever was willing to take that step. For her, Reiki was for everyone. But at the same time, she had no attachment to any specific person learning Reiki. Always offered, but without attachment. Because, I mean, what did I experience? I mean, um, I, for me, <laughs> you know, one of the ways that I just hold Reiki is it's, and um, I'm a Reformed Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning I was raised Catholic and then, uh, right, I was teaching religion in a Catholic school, right? So when I learned Reiki. And after I quit teaching and started teaching Reiki, I didn't go to church for just 25 years. <laughs> you know, it was... And at, at some point, Reiki led me back to my faith. I have no doubt about this. Reiki led me back. Why did I go there? I lost my train of thought. <laughs> so her, her trust, her profound trust, she gave me a connection with the energy of life. You know how she translated uh, Reiki in the class? The word, the term? Universal life energy or God power. That's how she translated it. Universal life energy or God power. Now, not many people translate it that way anymore. I do. <laughs> but what did that mean? You know, what did that mean to her? Um, I, you may have read this. It, uh, after Hawaii Takata's death, her daughter, Alice Furumoto, put together a little collection of things for her students, for Hawaii Takata's students, in a little book, uh, which we refer to as the Gray Book. <laughs> there were a hundred copies printed, no more. But uh, I, I did a little booklet for myself that then got adopted by the Reiki Alliance and I got permission from Alice to include this little writing, which is an essay that she wrote about Reiki and very early in her practice. And I, you know, I would just like to read three paragraphs to uh, just to, to give you a sense of how she experienced and held this energy that she called Reiki. In my attempt to write this essay in limited words on the art of healing, I will try to be practical rather than technical because what I'm about to define is not associated with any material being which is visible nor has shape nor name. I believe there exists one supreme being, the absolute infinite, a dynamic force that governs the world and universe. It is an unseen spiritual power. 
that vibrates and all other powers fade into insignificance beside it. So therefore, it is absolute. Different teachers and masters call him the great spirit, the universal life force, life energy. I shall call it Reiki because I studied under that expression. So she gave me a connection with the energy of life. And I became a faithful student, <laughs> which simply means that I used it, I practiced it, which is what she expected of her students. You know, she expected us to practice. And, and she also gave me six principles that she called the five Reiki principles. <laughs> so she had this charming relationship with numbers. So, <laughs> so it's like she said there are five Reiki principles and then she listed six. And in some people's experience, seven. Um, but somehow we got caught by the word five. And, and these were the five slash six that I received from her. Just for today, do not worry. Just for today, do not anger. Honor your parents, teachers, and elders. Earn your living honestly. Show gratitude to every living thing. Be kind to others. Now sadly, <laughs> Um, we only give five <laughs> in, in, my, in the tradition I'm a part of. We only give five. Um, although when I do workshops on principles, I, I, I include the sixth one. I, now, if we go to Dr. Sui's memorial stone, we find five principles. And the one that is not there is honor your parents, teachers, and elders. And here is my theory. My theory is that she understood these five principles as the basic principles of human life and interaction. It's like the way things work when human life works. The basic principles of human relatedness. And in the Asian cultures, honor your parents, teachers, and elders doesn't have to be listed because you get it with your mother's milk. It, you know, it is a basic principle of understanding human life in the Asian cultures. Honor your parents, teachers, and elders. And in her transition, in her uh, translation, I feel like she knew that this was missing in... Um, in the Western understanding of the principles of life. And so she gave me these two things, an initiation, a connection, a form of practice to, to go back to that connection over and over and over again and to, to, to be changed by that, correction, that connection, to be touched and a set of principles, which Usui Sensei describes as um, the secret method that summons happiness. When I first read that, I puzzled, what does that mean, the secret method? And what I, a friend of mine, who is a Buddhist, was reading 
a book by a, a lama, a teacher in her lineage, and she said, I came across that phrase, secret method. It's, she said it's like a technical term in Tibetan Buddhism, you know? And, and it, what it means is it's hard, it's difficult to realize and realize in, in these two, two modes of understanding. Realize means it's difficult for us to get it. It's like it's right in front of us, but we don't get it. And the other part is it's difficult to realize in terms of making real in our life. It's difficult to realize. And so what we bring to that is our dedication as a, as a student. And our determination to practice. I mean, for me, um, what I'm learning is really, um, or immersed in, or whatever, is the is my practice as a spiritual practice. You know, it feeds my spirit. And my spirit is hungry in the world I live in today. My spirit is hungry. One of my um, things I really believe is that this practice, this connection, nourishes, holds, supports, pushes us to realize the perfection of our humanity, which is the purpose of all religions and spiritual practices in their center. It's to find our place. To find our place. And, you know, we're, we're the products of our cultures. We're the products of our cultures. Um, Here's a quote I'd like to share with you. And then <laughs> it's by Rabbi Rami Shapiro. And he says this. To me, religions are like languages. No language is true or false. All languages are of human origin. Each language reflects, reflects and shapes the civilization that speaks it. There are things you can say in one language you cannot say or say as well in another language. And the more languages you learn, the more nuanced your understanding of life becomes. Judaism is my mother tongue. Yet in matters of the spirit, I strive to be multilingual. In the end, however, the deepest language of the soul is silence. Hawaii Takata used to say very clearly in her first week of classes, Reiki is not a religion. And I'm sure many people in the group sighed with relief. Either because they were really religious and they were a little bit scared about this weird stuff, or 
religion wasn't important or they had been raised in a religion and said, uh -uh, I'm out of here. This, this doesn't feed me. It's interesting, the root of the word religion. It's from the Latin. It means re ligare. Ligare means to connect. To connect. Re ligare means to reconnect. The Australian Reiki connection. <laughs> Okay, connection. Connection with what? With our spirit, which is connected to what? All that is. All that is. And in this simple practice that we received, we could take it anywhere. It was, it brought us, I believe, to the simple reconnection that we all long for. We all long for this deep connection with, with the infinite, you know, with all that is, with the spirit of source. We connect and we come to that connection and it nourishes us and it feeds us and it awakens us. I, my experience of practicing Reiki over the years is a continual process of awakening. Continual process of awakening. And part of that is letting go is letting go of how I understood things before. You know, because, you know, I was born human. I didn't come out of fish. I was born human. That was clear. But what did my family do? They took it on because it was their responsibility to teach me what it meant to be human. And they did the best they could from their understanding. That's what parents do. They protect, they guide. Their intention is to offer the child guidance so that they can be happy, fulfilled, successful in their lives. That's their intention. And it's limited. It's limited. And the culture that holds it is limited. It's, just, it's limited. It's just part of the program. I can't help it. I didn't make it up. It's part of the program. And so we're always looking for, reaching for what's alive in us, our true selves. And uh, this yearning to develop, not because we're not good enough or we haven't gone far enough. It's because it's the nature of life. The nature of life is, de is to develop. And we, when we do Reiki, we, we connect with that source of life and it feeds that even more to, to develop. That's the call of all of life. I feel like, you know, we need to share and we need to talk about how we understand the human journey. We need to have a, a glimpse of where we're going. You know, several years ago, there was an American guy who had been a therapist all of his life. His name is Thomas Moore. And he wrote a book called Care of the Soul. And many people thought it was a great book. The fact that it, that it sold over a million copies is so encouraging, you know, because 
because he's talking about the soul in public. You know, it's like this part of us, call it our spirit, call it soul, I don't care. I'm not attached to how we hold that. But it's a part of ourselves, this, our, our connection with all that is, you know, our connection with source, and it, it, you know, the expression of the divine that we are. But where are we going? I would love for the Reiki community to take time and space in sharing what's true for us, what we're learning about what the purpose of life is. You know, that's a un, that is a, that is a dumb question not to be living by, not to be connected to. You know, what is the purpose of this journey that we call life? Um, and, you know, if I look at culture, I'm in trouble. You know, I'm in trouble. Because we're blind, we're all blind. That's why we need to wake up over and over and over again. You know, Australians and Americans sh share a <laughs> shame. <laughs> it may be applicable. Share a common culture. You know, we were um, colonizing. We were bringing civilization to uncivilized worlds. You know, it was like our picture, our story, and so that what was there had no value. You know, I was touched by the beginning of honoring the people of this land. Yeah. So we didn't see their gift. We couldn't, because we were blinded by our own story. And we continually do that. Our spiritual life brings us, as a journey, to um, to be conscious of where we're going. A little quote from uh, Thomas Merton, who was a 20th century um, mystic Trappist monk who had great influence in the United States and beyond. And this is from a little book uh, that of his writings called Choosing to Love the World. What a title, Choosing to Love the World. And he says, if you want a spiritual life, you must unify your life. Life is either all spiritual or not at all. Your life is shaped by the end you live for. You are made in the image of what you desire. Your life is shaped by the end you live for. You are made in the image of what you desire. It's important. Oh, so. Thomas More says, this is what the soul needs. The soul. Okay, what the soul needs. It needs an articulated worldview. Now, I, I understand this word articulation in two ways. It's like I can articulate it, I can like give it expression, and articulation is like you know the articulation of joints. It's like they fit and they work, right? So a worldview that fits, that, that works, and I would add, and is big enough for who we are as human beings. It's big enough for the human spirit. Because there are a lot of worldviews out there that in my not so humble opinion are not big enough for who we are as human beings. They're not big enough. So an articulated worldview, a carefully worked out scheme of values and a sense of relatedness to the whole We need an attitude towards death 
and a myth of immortality. You know, where do we come from? Where are we going? You know, one of the things that we've given up in modern life is origin stories, is mythology, you know. Origin stories are not, may not be factually true, but they tell a deeper truth. You know, if we look at origin stories, creation stories from different cultures, we find them often saying the same basic truth. You know, the Buddhist thing is it uh, talks about uh, non-independent origination, which means that we didn't make ourselves. (laughs) We came out of life. We came out of spirit. And, you know, each of us needs our own story that can, that can place ourselves in our life. It can be our touchstone. You know, what is it about? Where am I going? It's the place from which I can really work out my values. You know? You know, in the, in the United States and maybe in Australia too, uh, we've made choices. We chose security over solidarity. That's the American story. Rugged individual, make your way. You're responsible for your life. You know, get ahead. The American dream. And make sure you have enough put by so you can retire and then have fun. You know, it's like, So we've chosen security over solidarity. Now that's a deep, deep cultural impregnation. So it's like, look at us here. We're coming together. We're coming together. We're an incredibly pluralistic group. You know, it doesn't matter what your background was, or what your education was, what your, you know, beliefs is. You know, it doesn't matter what your story is. It doesn't matter what your wounds are. It doesn't matter what your gifts are. It's like, it, what your sexual orientation is. It, it, none of that matters. Male, female, old, young. It's like Reiki brings us together. It, it connects. It's why I can, I can be at peace and at home here, even though I start out being a little nervous. But I can, I can be with you because I know you. I know you because, because we share Reiki. So Reiki is drawing us to solidarity and maybe, maybe, step by step, we're growing into the capacity to, uh, to impregnate ourselves with that as our primary value. And the principles help, really help, <laughs> right? Really help. What I didn't know, what I got tricked into when I raised my hand and (laughs) signed up for the Reiki class was that I would be put on a healing journey. That's what happened. You know, I, you know, my answer to the first question that I asked the four of you, the four questions was, I wanted to help people. I wanted to help people. That's why I took Reiki. And I wanted to be a little bit special. In my helpfulness and in being 
able to heal others. I wanted to be a little, maybe I wanted to be big special. I don't know. You decide. <laughs> you know, that, that was my conscious motivation. You know, I came up with these four questions, by the way. So when I, when I did the exercise myself, you know, my, my unconscious reason, I realized the hidden reason was that I needed healing, that my spirit was longing for healing. You know. And I have been forced <laughs> to live with that question, what is healing? And I invite all of us to live that question and to be able to answer it at any given moment and be able not to be attached to that answer because we're gonna understand more and we're gonna understand more. You know, the root of the word healing comes from the Greek and means wholeness, wholeness. So the question is, what does it mean to be whole as a human being? And it's out of that question, you know, that we find our purpose and that we, and that we live from that purpose. And, and, you know, we can't be attached to it because it will change, it can change. I'm uh, going to look at my watch because I have no idea where I am in timing. What time do we end? I want to know what time we end, please. <laughs> we have about 10 minutes left of talk and then we take 10, 15 minutes of questions. Oh, okay. Good. So, um, we're on this healing journey together. And, and when I look to the future of Reiki, for me, it's that we, we integrate ourselves, that capacity in ourselves to be healers to such an extent that when those are the glasses that we look through, when we look out at anything at any moment, that that's the part of ourselves that, 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 that lets us see, that lets us see. I mean, it's fascinating to me um, because, you know, there have been great religious leaders who healed. But you know what? In my observation, healing was never the point. <laughs> I mean, the physical healing was never the point. It was, it was just an opportunity for people to go, whoa, oh. <gasps> More is possible than I ever imagined. You know, it's like this wake-up call to not be limited to our understanding of what life was at that moment. It was a wake-up call. And there was always more. <laughs> and what was more was a path laid out. For what? for awakening, for being free, for developing. And, and you know, we find that in different ways, in different expressions. It's expressed as compassion or as love. Um, and, you know, it's the teaching that included all of us, not just the physical, but included all of us and honored who we really are. 
this, this amazing manifestation of divine creativity. You know, really finding our place. And then Dr. Asui came along <laughs> because, and, and, and put that capacity, that healing capacity, in all of our hands. Put it in all of our hands. Isn't that amazing? And maybe because what the world needs, Ugh. maybe in our journey, our human journey, what is called for is, um, is those who look beyond themselves, who look beyond themselves to the, to the good of all. Yeah. I have to tell you a horrible story. It comes from my country. So the state of uh, Oklahoma traditionally has had an average of two or three earthquakes a year. Okay? Now, we've developed this marvelous new technique to get oil out of the ground we couldn't get out before. It's called fracking. You know, it's like pumping water, which like we have plenty of, into the earth, you know, and so now Oklahoma has over a hundred earthquakes a year. Over a hundred. And it went to the legislature. Legislature, they make the laws, right? And the legislature said, yes, we agree, the rise in earthquakes is the result of fracking. And that was the end. That was the end. The end. Right? Security over solidarity. You know, it's like, There's this concept of the common good, the common good. I, I, I feel like, you know, in, in our lives in Reiki, we're, we're just led to, to reach beyond ourselves. And, and we're led to, to to create a story, a picture, that really has this as a value. My brothers and sisters, the common good. And, you know, we're, we're on that journey. That's what I feel. And then, you know, Reiki is spreading. I mean, is this prophetic or what? Here's a, a translation of the memorial stone. And the, the man who writes it ends with this. In recent times, people's have, ideas have changed drastically. But happily, so this is in, obviously there's a value here, you know. People, have, ideas have changed drastically and they're not good. They're not, they're not so great. But happily, the Reiki method is spreading. And that people who are following the same path And the fact that people who are following the same path are helping one another is wonderful. We're following the same path. That was written, what, in 
seven or something, 28 or something. Ideas have changed a lot since then. (laughs) But luckily, the Reiki method is spreading. And, you know, the, the call, I feel, is for us to practice deeply. To practice the principles. I don't have a button. <laughs> but, you know, for me, my teacher said, practice every day. Treat yourself every day. You know, because Reiki works in us. It works in us. It awakens us continuously to our truer selves and our potential and, and our vocation. I love that word, vocation. You know, it comes from the Latin word uh, vocare. Vocare means to call. And vocation comes from the past participle. <laughs> I studied Latin a little bit. <laughs> which is, which the past participle is translated as vocatus, is having been called. Okay? So, you know, right away it's connection. It's connection to something bigger. So vocation is, is having been called by something bigger. And each of us, every human being, is called by something bigger, really to, to manifest our potential as healers. Because... It's part of life. So, I think I'll stop there. And um, open it for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. That was most enlightening. Thank you. Is there anybody here who would uh, like to ask Paul a question? If I could just ask that you keep the question short and just restrict yourself to one question initially. If we have time, we can go back to you. So I'll come to you with the mic. Yeah, tomorrow is, is the day for the many questions. So I'll just start with this lady here. Thank you. Hi, that was fantastic. I really enjoyed listening to all of that. Was, yeah. Um, my question is, um, you mentioned how you weren't allowed to keep notes when you were taught by Hawaii Takata, and that fascinates me. And I was wondering, when you got together later with the other teachers, did, were you, did you compare your symbols and things, and were they different, and, and how, did, how was that conversation? That, yeah, really intrigues me. Uh-huh. <laughs> So, um, in 1982, um, Phyllis Formoto invited all the masters that her grandmother had initiated and the few that she had initiated at that time to spend a week together in Hawaii. And by the way, I would like to extend Phyllis Formoto's greeting to you and her delight that we're all together doing what we're doing. So I wanted to, to share that with you. So uh, we came together, and yes, one of the things that we uh, shared, um, actually I don't, well, I can't remember. I was, I'm not really sure if we shared the symbols or not. Okay, but we shared, well, we probably did, because I think we shared everything. And, um, and, <laughs> and each one of us, until we got tired of it, said, my teacher showed me this. The positions for treating the head are just like this. 
And then someone else would say, my teacher showed me this, exactly like this. And they were a little different. And, and so our initial reaction was to be a little bit freaked out. A little bit freaked out. I was pretty young, so possibly a little defensive. Uh, <laughs> Uh, maybe a little insecure. Uh, who knows? So they were a little bit different. And as we sat together, and as we um, were together and practiced together, what the place that we came to was, they're different and they're not. They're different and they're not. And, you know, it was a great puzzlement to us in a way um, because um, because she was so clear. <laughs> you know, so right away it's like somehow we had to expand into a- another awareness, right? So, um, somebody I've read has this, this, um, this defini- definition of the word revelation. Revelation. It's like, you know, something new. And he says, every revelation comes with a shattering of what was before. That's the nature Revelation shattering. Revelation shattering. And, and that's my experience of Reiki. It just keeps revealing itself. <laughs> and I have to let go. So, so we had to somehow feel, actually, and luckily we had a week together, <laughs> feel that what we had received was, was it. Together. What we had received together was it, and, uh, and honor that. Yeah, so hopefully that. Thank, Thank you. you, Paul. Is there anyone else who would like to? This person had a question. Oh, yeah. Hello, I'm Margie Rowe from Darwin. Just wanted to ask a question, what you call an individual Reiki treatment that you give, give on someone, that you give to someone else? What's the name? What do you call it? Um, I call it a Reiki treatment. Just thank like you. you did. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> uh, thank you. Oh, I see some. Yeah. <coughs> Christian Le Cornu. Uh, I had the privilege to have quite a chat with you last night. At one stage, I ask you, in view of the information coming out uh, of uh, Japan by various um, people who have done some studies, some research, uh, what do you think, teach, the story that Hawaii Takata brought to the West? And you gave me quite a lovely answer. Would you mind sharing it with everybody? (laughs) (laughs) Hmm. Okay. Anybody else have that question? Nobody else has that question. Then I think we're complete. Yeah, fair. Okay, that's more clear. <laughs> I mean, I asked you if anybody shared the question. Nobody raised their hand. Okay. So, so, yeah, one one of the things that uh, Hawaii Takata said in her first degree class was that Reiki is an oral tradition. And, you know, I was 32 years old 
don't know if I heard the phrase before. My understanding when I heard that was, oh, nothing is written about Reiki. It's only spoken. Um, and then a few years later, uh, that wasn't the true anymore. And now there are a gazillion written books. And, and yet, that teaching has just deepened in me. It's like, well, what is oral tradition? And uh, I won't go through all the steps of my own kind of understanding, but what I understand is that or an oral tradition is um, is an opening of sacred space. And I only learn that through teaching and then paying attention to treatments. You know, when I stepped into a first degree class, the energy opened. Sacred space was created. Uh, another field, another energy field. Y you know, it's like finding the words. So the, the new words are energy field, okay? A space was opened which, in which the energy is the teacher. Energy is the teacher. And, I, you know, my next, I lied, my next understanding of, of oral tradition was I had to be with the person physically, you know? I had to be there to initiate them. You know, that, that was it. This, this ceremony, the, this connection could only come through that us being together in this space. And the, and, and the outcome of that was profound. Eventually, in fact, when I was, the first, I was first teaching Reiki, I would say to my students, it doesn't matter anything I say to you. What's important is that we're together and I do the initiation. That we're, that's what's important. You know, I would never say that today because it's not true for me. <laughs> Everything I say in that class is important because it carries energy. Because it's touching people in a way that I'm, I'm not even aware of. I just, I see the, you know, the, the point of the iceberg. That's what oral tradition is for me. It's the opening of a, of a, a sacred space where, where the, what happens is way beyond the sum of the parts. Way beyond the sum of the parts. And I struggle with the story at the beginning because I thought, if I tell the story, everybody's going to leave. You know, it's like, it's just too fantastic. It's too something. And then one of my students who kept repeating my class, you know, one day she comes to me at the end of a class and she says, you know, I come just to hear the story. So I had to take that in and pay attention. For me, the story that I tell, which is the story that Hawaii Takata told, is, um, has a mythical quality. It carries energy. And, you know, we don't understand myth anymore, although in Western cultures, although in all, every other culture <laughs> understood myth. It's not, the, the story doesn't have to be factual, but it's, it's telling a deeper truth. It's teaching us something about how things work. And I have a profound relationship to that story in terms of it containing my story, my journey. And so I tell it the same. 
I have a student who's, who has a German Reiki magazine. His name is Oliver Klott. Some of you may know him. Um, and, you know, and he's written a book on, you know, the different forms of Reiki. And, uh, and so he, he started telling the true history <laughs> of Reiki, you know, from information that he put together, things, information coming out of Japan, um, and it's getting cleaner. You know, the first information for me was 10% information, 90% interpretation. Um, but over the years, we've all grown and <laughs> we're more accurate in terms of how we present. So he's, you know, he's this very upright guy, you know, and so he's gonna, he has to tell the real, the real history. And um, that went on for a while. And then you know what he told me? <laughs> he says, I had to go back to the old story, which he calls the legend of Reiki. He says, I'm going to tell you the legend of Reiki. And then, and then he also gives some information, right? The end. But you know what he told me? He said, I had to go back to telling that story because it carried energy. And my other sharing did not. So, you know, when, when, when uh, nature-based um, tribal peoples sat around the fire in the evening and the elders told the stories, it placed people, you know, it, it placed them. Where am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? And many of those stories are origin stories, and there are hundreds of origin stories, and they're not the same. And they are the same. You know, there's a, there's a teaching that's deeper than that. And um, so, that's how I hold it. Still today. Thank you.